Welcome to Building Better Businesses. I'm Kristen Dees, founder of Catalyst Consulting, an agency that helps small businesses and entrepreneurs start, grow, and level up their businesses. This podcast will bring you interviews with experts in all things business related. Have questions for a business attorney? We've got answers. How about your health insurance? Got you covered there too. New episodes coming your way every week. Find us on the podcasting platform of your choice. Building Better Businesses with Catalyst Consulting is brought to you in partnership with Speak Studios and Speak Spokane, presented by Delicious Hamburgers. Speak Spokane is a community-driven studio space where voices from all walks of life can speak and be heard. You can find them on Instagram and Facebook at Speak Studios, Speak Spokane, and at their website, speakpodcasting.com. Speak Studios, speak and be heard. Building Better Businesses with Catalyst Consulting is brought to you in partnership with Spin City, Spin City is an indoor cycling studio that strives on making sure everyone feels welcome and comfortable. At Spin City, exercise is more than physical, it's a mental workout. When you come to Spin City, you become family. Spin City is family-owned and believes supporting our community is the most important way to help grow our city. Email them now at info at spincityspokane.com or call anytime at 509-919-4824. We're all spending a little bit more time at home. So let the Furniture Outpost serve your needs. Locally owned and located in the heart of Spokane's Monroe Business District, the Furniture Outpost is there for your furniture needs. Sofas and love seats, sectionals, dining room, bedroom sets, mattresses, and so much more. No matter what you are looking for, they have it. Financing is a breeze with the Furniture Outpost. Come see them at 2801 North Monroe Street. Welcome to the first episode of Building Better Businesses with Catalyst Consulting. My very first guest is Jeff Conroy, owner and founder of Conroy Leadership Consulting, correct? Is the whole correct. leadership. Okay. That's, we both have like super long, <laughs> super long titles. So, yep. <laughs> um, and then regretted our decision when we have an email now that's like a hundred letters long. So <laughs> and you have to tell people about it. Yep. C-O-N. Yeah. And they're like, How, what's your email? I'm like, oh God, I don't even want to tell you. <laughs> it's so bad. Uh, and my name too gets misspelled a lot. So I have to be like K-R-I-S-T-I-N. Um, but yeah, I don't know how to turn my notifications off. It's okay. When I was director of the United Way, I had to say, what's your email? And it's Jeff at Kootenai County United Way. And oh my like, God, that's so terrible. What? And I'm like, man, it couldn't get an acronym. No, it was already taken. No, God, Kootenai is hard to spell too and say. So, dang, good for you. You made it this yeah. far. Look at you. So I resilient. Know, right? <laughs> right? Adapt, uh, adapt. It's great. Okay. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. So tell us okay. a little bit, uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm first of all, I'm honored to be the, your first guest. Thank you, Kristen. That was nice. Um, well, I spent 30 years in the nonprofit world. I, I started with the Boy Scouts of America and went to the United Way and then ended my career with uh, St. Vincent de Paul of North Idaho, uh, working in nonprofits, worked my way up from uh, grass floor to uh, the CEO. I spent the last 14 years as a CEO. So uh, learned a lot, worked for different levels of, of nonprofits, worked for a, a nonprofit that is a one-person nonprofit, and I've worked with uh, nonprofits that have 103 employees. I've worked with nonprofits that have a budget of $500,000, and I've worked with a nonprofit that's got a budget of $7 million. So, um, and, I, and there are days when I would say I've seen it all, and then something would happen, and I'd say, well, I didn't see that one coming. So uh, constantly learning still after 30 years, 30-plus 30 years, but... Uh, uh, I enjoyed my journey through the nonprofit world. Love what I did. Uh, it was a great time, but it was kind of after 30 years time to want to see what I can do on my own. So in 2019, I jumped out into the self-employed world and uh, decided let's try uh, let's try consulting. Um, about 10 years leading up that I was I was consulting, but not officially. I was working with uh, organizations uh, on leadership and structure and organization and time management and uh, communication and those types of things just because I felt if anybody's got this much time in they they have a duty to work with other people it was just it was a calling for me 
but when I decided to go out on my own and get, get paid for it, it was a different world. Um, but I, I still kind of do that. I, I, I work with, with insurance companies. I work with hospitals. I work with medical people. I work with um, uh, nonprofits still. Uh, that's where my, that's where my passion is. It still was nonprofits. And, uh, I work with, uh, work with everyday issues that they're dealing with. They're dealing with, you know, how do I, how do I get staff members to do what I want? <laughs> how do I build relationships? How do I, what's, what's communication and developing budgets? Uh, I do board retreats, those types of things. So, uh, I've, I've been doing what I've been doing for about the last 10 years, but now I'm doing it for pay. And I've been doing it since 2019 and I was things were going fantastic and then the world stopped in March of 2020 and uh, but I still kind of do a little bit here and there I, I work with a nonprofit uh, down in Moscow uh, Idaho and work with a nonprofit up in Sandpoint and, uh, so it's, it's it's still the world is starting to awaken a little bit so I'm I'm optimistic very cool yeah I really like um, what you do and I think originally that's kind of how we connected is the leadership philosophy employee engagement all of that kind of stuff and I think our first conversation was yeah. like an hour of just like talking about leadership and um, all, all the things that kind of touch on that so and I think that you and I both agree that leadership is different than management oh um, definitely in a as far as skill sets and experience go. So well, well relationships all about uh, leadership's about relationships. It's building yeah. relationships with those people that you work with and the people around you. So um, management is, you know, you manage your checkbook, you lead people. So building you, to lead people, you need to build the relationships. And that's to me, one of the best parts of being a leader is the friends and the relationships you build along the way. Yeah, I agree. That's actually, one of my, I don't know if you've heard of strengths find strengths finders, you probably have. Um, mm -hmm. but one of my top strengths is always relator, um, which is kind of funny because I'm an introvert and I don't love small talk, but oh my God, I love talking about like the getting to know you stuff, like the nitty gritty, <laughs> like let's talk yeah. about your feelings and yeah. your experiences and, and all that kind of stuff. I love that. So, well, and people are interesting. Yeah. People are fascinating. It yeah. doesn't matter who you are. You can always find something to talk about with, with someone, um, yeah. no matter what, unless they really don't want to talk to you. Right. Which is fine. I'll allow it. Uh, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I, okay. I, I jokingly say I should have been a sociology major because I find people really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Anthropology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, just, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. I think it's kind of funny how you sort of end up where you are and, and kind of find those things about yourself along the way. Like I've always just been in leadership. I uh, got my first leadership position when I was 19. And then from there on out, that's just, that's who I am. But uh, the journey in leadership has been crazy. Like I can't even imagine, yeah. but I can't be a, I can't be an individual contributor anymore. Like I have, I still have somewhat of a leadership role in the consulting aspect of things. So yeah, uh, it's a little bit different, but but, awesome. it's, um, but, but, the, but the whole leadership thing is collaboration. So the more you get to know about people, uh, you know, the more you can synergize together mm -hmm. and create stuff. That's, that's, yeah, we can talk for hours. You, you, I and, I know, yeah. you and I have never had a problem talking. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could just go for days and then people will be like, what the hell were they even talking about? Exactly, exactly. We, we're fine. Yeah, you guys will catch up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, share a fun fact about you. I might know what it is, but I'd like to see what you come up with. <laughs> Uh, in high school, my senior year, I was I was a music person in high school, and I went on to get my bachelor's degree in music. But my thing, fun fact about me is um, I was given Mr. Show Band. Given Mr. Show, what does that mean? For it means uh, it just like I guess you know the inspirational. You know, I always look at it most inspirational. But they oh, gave up okay. for, the, for the jazz band, so I was part of the jazz band. So, but I'm also oh, a Disney, gotcha. I'm, I call myself a Disney file because I, I'm a Disney fanatic. Yeah, that's what I was gonna so, guess. <laughs> yeah, Disney, Disney fanatic. Cool. Well, it's in my, in that Disney f f fanaticism has grown into. I know people that work at Disney, and I know <laughs> the guy that ran Disney World. <laughs> it just yep. it, it just spiraled from there. <laughs> no, I like it. Well, and it's just one of those things too. Like if you're, if you're really interested in something and you just put the effort into, um, expanding the horizons when it comes to, it's limitless. Like you just kind of put yourself in situations where, you know, the guy who ran his yeah. new world, you know, it's yeah. like that doesn't yeah. happen, but if you just keep putting yourself in these places, then it happens. So 
Yeah. Well, and um, Lee had Lee had a hand in creating uh, Conroy Leadership Consulting. So, oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. It's a big part. That's why, big part that's why of the journey. color. Yeah, that's why the colors on my logo are the way they are. They're Disney colors. Oh, they okay. are. Yep. They are. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Yep. (laughs) Um, So we talked a little bit about who your clients are, Um, maybe a little bit more in detail of the background, like what made you decide to focus on leadership consulting specifically, like um, from the beginning to now? Yeah. Uh, The leadership aspect of organizations and how people work um, has always fascinated me. So, you know, I started off reading the the Stephen Coveys and the Zig Ziglers and the John Maxwells of the world. And then when I decided to go to Gonzaga and get my um, organizational development masters, um, they turned me on to books like Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Desmond Tutu. And and I just find the, the leadership process and mentality incredibly fascinating. And, and the more I got to know, again, Lee Cockrell, who ran Disney World, and I get to meet other leaders locally, um, their, their leadership style um, motivates me. And so I get excited about it. I, I excited about how do we connect with people? How do we connect with people? And how do we get the best out of the people? And in return, how do we protect the people? COVID is a perfect example of that. You know, what leaders... Yeah, leaders are supposed to get the best out of their people, but they're also supposed to protect their people. So how are leaders protecting their people? And those are the conversations I'm having leaders now with with now. If, if your office gets COVID, what are you doing type stuff? Um, there should be a plan in place. But the reason I chose leadership is because it, it fascinates me and it's a passion of mine because uh, it's, it's a mindset and a process that takes time. It's leadership is not an overnight experience. It's it's a, a long time journey that is ever evolving and ever changing. Um, what you think is going to motivate one person will not motivate another person. So you're constantly uh, working on, well, this worked with Kristen. How come it's not working with Jeff? Uh, so there's that that element of it. And that's why I really like the disc assessment, the disc behavior assessment that really helps me on that. Um, and it helps people find out things about themselves as well. So, uh, but leadership is a, is a science that just fascinates me on um, why people do what they do and how can I, how can I get the best out of people and what would motivate them? Yeah, no, I like that. Cause it is, it, that's one of my favorite things about it as well is the individualization aspect and getting to know what really makes somebody tick, um, and being able to help people achieve things sometimes that they didn't even realize they had in them. Because you just spent the time and the effort. And I feel like you would agree with this as well, that most people aren't self-aware. And so that's a big part of it is getting to know people and then helping them also understand themselves to be able to kind of achieve those things that, like I said, they didn't know that they had in them. So yeah, um, yeah, it is fascinating. I love people. (laughs) Yeah, I do. And and, and I was working with a guy with with a CEO and he was wondering why his middle managers weren't producing with the staff. Well, the more I found out is that the CEO would bypass the middle managers and go to the grassroots staff. He would totally leave middle managers out of it. And I kind of said, do you know, do you, do you do that? And he goes, well, I don't think I do. <laughs> but, yeah. But that's that self-awareness, right? Yeah. Uh, they, You're like, well, know, I mean, you do. <laughs> do. And, yeah. and it's causing a problem. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but it's tough though. Cause that's, you can't, sometimes you just can't see that stuff. Um, like even, you know, for us, we work essentially independently now, but still need other people to kind of talk through stuff like that sometimes where you're like, I can't figure out why I can't get this thing to work. Like, it seems yeah. like I should. I'm smart. I'm experienced. I'm educated. I should be able to do this. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you just need somebody on the outside to be like, no, don't. You sh- Please don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're going to hurt yourself. So, um, yeah. But, I mean, and, and for me, I, I surrounded my, you know, I have three other CEO friends that that we communicate often and, and they're just, and that's exactly what I do. And they'll say, how are things going? I said, well, I've got this issue or I've got this problem or I've got this person, you know, and this is kind of what I'm thinking. I, sometimes I just need validation or they give me something that I don't know. I, I'm not looking at. So it's just, yeah. it's interesting because in the workplace, common sense isn't common practice in most cases, you know, when, when organizations yeah. are, are struggling, a lot of times it's the structure and organization piece. And they're not, they're not built that way. I worked with a nonprofit who, who wanted to do all these things. But once we drew out their, their org chart, there was a big gaping hole saying, you can't do that without this type of person. 
So yeah. common, common practice isn't, isn't common. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think people also have a different definition of what common sense is too. Like everyone thinks that it's the same thing and everyone has a different interpretation, sure. which sort of, you know, is the irony of it being common sense is like you said, it's not. <laughs> it's not. So, yeah. 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 Common, common sense isn't common practice and people need to, no. people need to look at themselves a little bit. Yep. Um, so what, what are like maybe the top two common themes that you kind of help people with like issues across the board, um, with, you know, nonprofit or businesses, et cetera? Uh, two of the biggest ones are, um, structure and organization. Um, a lot of times they, they want to, they want to grow and they, they don't know how to grow or they need to be seen how to grow. And the other one, uh, that's really common these days is time management. You know, how do I, how do I organize my, my day better to, to achieve more or, you know, I believe that there, there's not, there's not work life and there's not personal life. There's just life and it's how you, how you divvy it up. So I work with them on, you know, let's get your work out of the way so you can spend time with your family Mm -hmm. uh, and and spend time with your personal, personal self. So I do a lot of that. So a lot of structure and organization and a lot of time management stuff. That makes sense. That's actually very similar to a lot of the things I help people with too, is that um, the structure, implementing processes, filling in gaps, helping them put key people in the right positions to kind of help with the the balance right. aspect and some of the time management stuff. Right. Because you can only get so far if you're wearing all of the hats. Like there's there's right. actual limitations. <laughs> so, right. Um, yeah, no, I love that. Okay. Um, how do you describe leadership? Like in, I don't know, less than a 30 hour uh, thesis. <laughs> well, 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 my definition. Well, my definition of a leadership is anybody who can influence change is a leader. And I don't think you need to. Have, it's it's the old you know the the, the old pithy, um, you know, saying of you know you don't need a title, salary, or position to be a leader. Everyone can be a leader, and I believe that. I believe that anybody who can influence change. Um, I tell people that, uh, in in staffs that all the time. You don't need to be the manager to be the leader. There, there's always a leader who uh, steps forward, an unofficial leader that the staff listens to and the staff will follow always other than the, yep. the, the, the official leadership. So it's just, it's just that person that has um, charisma. Um, I don't believe in my opinion, I don't believe that people are born leaders. I think people are born with charisma that other people are drawn to. Uh, so if you're drawn to, I mean, if, if that person with charisma, uh, has some leadership skills and is able to, um, uh, rally the troops unofficially, um, that's your leader. Um, that's just my opinion, but, uh, uh, yeah, anybody, anybody can influence change is, is a leader to me. And, uh, I tell, I tell my kids that I tell other people that all the time they're saying, I can't do this. My boss won't do it. And I said, but you do it. Be exceptional at what you do. Be, be super exceptional at what you do. Become the expert that everyone comes to you. Mm-hmm. You don't need to have the title or the pay. Yeah, I like that. So I that kind of leads me into um, another question that I wrote down was, um, do you think you need employees to be a leader in business? Do I, do I need, do employees need to be leaders in business? No. Do you, do you think you need employees to be considered a leader, like in, in your business or what you do? Um, no. If that makes sense. Or can you, can you do that in the community? Can you find other ways to demonstrate leadership uh, as part of your culture? You betcha. I mean, as you carry yourself, you know, you are your best brand, you know, uh, what's the saying? Uh, you, you, you judge yourself on your intentions. Others judge you uh, based upon your actions. So based upon your actions makes you a leader. You can talk the talk all you want, but you, but your actions make you a leader. Do you need employees to become a leader? No, you can be a leader as a person of, of uh, uh, high, in- high integrity and uh, someone who's open and someone who enjoys teaching. You can do that makes leaders but you don't need employees to be leaders. It just anybody of high integrity and, and, and enthusiasm to, to serve others. I like that. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thanks. Because I think sometimes people maybe get hung up on that concept too, like that if you don't have employees and you don't have, you know, a real business, quote unquote, or maybe you're, you can't be considered a leader. But I think that, um, like you said, you are who, how you, how you show up for your community and your clients and customers and um, people that you work with, because you still have partners. Sure. You, I mean, you can't do literally everything on your own. You're going to have partners in some way. So I think you can demonstrate. Well, like you, and I, like, um, like you, you and I, you and I don't have staffs, you know, yeah. but we still work with people and lead people and people, people know who we are because of the way we carry ourselves and the way we serve others. Yeah, that's true. I like to think, I like to think of myself in that way. I try to um, be a resource and be somebody that people can reach out to if they need help with something, <laughs> you know, it doesn't really yeah. matter. It doesn't have to be business. It doesn't have to be, they're paying me for services, but I like to have that, um, that perception is what I kind of shoot for. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, excellent. Okay. So where do you think business owners fall short when it comes to leadership in their organizations, just in general, maybe right now, like you said, with the COVID stuff or. Yeah, I think they need to have a plan for COVID, uh, in case their office gets it. Um, and it should be swift and it should be, um, should be known. It should be written up and given to the staff saying, if we get COVID, actually it's, it's become more of a when instead of an if, but if COVID comes to our office, this is the process we're going to do or the procedures, you know, step one, step two, step three, uh, that needs to be, that needs to be really done and ranging from everything to everybody leaves the office immediately and goes and gets tested and not allowed back until you get bring back your negative test to hiring an organization or a cleaning company to come fog your office to clean your office at the micro level um just it it's it's the job to take care of the staff you got to take care of your team mm -hmm. uh the other part is um i sometimes feel that leaders struggle with communication um they talk at, they don't talk to. If you talk at your staff versus if you talk to your staff. And talking to your staff is uh, providing clarity on where they fit within the organization and clarity on where the organization is going. Talking at staff is basically just telling them what to do and there's no motivation. You know, they're just, they're just doing their job. I think people are happier when they feel like they're part of something bigger and they're contributing to that and they're being heard. So that's where the communication comes in. I think communication is about 99% of the world's problems. You know, if people would just effectively communicate, all the world's problems would go away. Yeah, and try to understand other people's perspectives, I think in general, just a yeah. little bit more because I think that's that's one of the things that you're kind of talking about with the communication stuff too. I've I've known a lot of leaders who are like, well, they just don't get it, so that's not my problem. Or I'm going to send only emails, and that's how I send my communication, and they just need to figure it out. And I'm like, I I mean, yeah, that probably works for half the people, but a lot of right. the other people don't. Un, they either don't read and uh, comprehend in that same way. Right. I'm the type of person that likes to answer or ask a lot of questions. So sometimes yeah. I, you know, people would get annoyed because I'm like, I need to know until it makes sense. I will ask you questions until it makes sense to me <laughs> because I need right. to understand why we're doing this ma madness. Like what is, right. there right. has to be a plan. Um, what's, what's the purpose? Why are we doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Are we just like doing some random uh, pizza party for no, like what's the point anyway? Right. Well, <laughs> the awful. worst is, the worst is when I hear, oh, we've always done it this way. Oh my God. Does not make it right? <laughs> no. <laughs> God, that stresses me out. That is, that's definitely one of my pet peeves too. Well, this is how I've always done it. I'm like, oh, I can't, I yeah. can't with you. Um, yeah. But that's also why I don't work in corporate life anymore because <laughs> right. I can't do it because right. that's why, um, <laughs> you know, bless their hearts. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a spot for everybody. And I finally kept realizing, I'm like, I keep banging my head against a, a wall. I should just leave. Like, cause they're not going to change the corporations. Aren't, they do not care what I have to say. Right. So I'm out. <laughs> Right. I but can you know do better what? When, things when, outside. When, when communication is clear, is clear, magical things happen. You know, mm -hmm. in 2017, when we brought Lee Cockrell to Coeur d'Alene, you know, over the course of two and a half days, we dealt with 1,500 people. And that whole event was put on by seven staff members. Seven. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. It is crazy. But there was clarity. There was purpose. There was a script. There was a timeline. 
everybody was everybody was on the same page and everybody had input and we worked on it and we talked about what ifs and we talk about what happens if this happens and how do we do this and and it was down it was down so well that when game day came it it was it was a friend of mine used to say it ran like a rolex it's <laughs> nice yeah well it's like if you if everybody knows what they're doing, they understand what their role in the the process, project, organization, whatever, they understand what their role is and what you're trying to accomplish, then people are also able to problem solve more effectively too. And I think that yes. that's that's in that's part of that that piece is like what are we actually trying to accomplish? The talking to versus at, like go make sure these chairs are set up and then they go do that and there's not a, enough room for all the chairs. But if they right. know, right, they can fix that problem for you. If they understand, oh, okay, well it's fine. We're only scheduled to have this many. It's I can put these over here. Great, <laughs> boom, problem solved. <laughs> well, that's exactly so. right, and, and 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 that's exactly what happened. Is that there was no possessiveness. Like this is my job. It was this. This is what we're working for, and we're all working towards that goal. And like I said, two and a half days. Everybody was tired, but seven people did that, and I called them the and still do call them the magnificent seven, and it was amazing. It's amazing event. <laughs> yeah. That's incredible. 1500 people. That's a lot. That is a yeah. huge event. So that's very cool. Um, I feel like I had another thought, but um, I'll ask you my next question. Um, who is responsible for company culture in your opinion? CEO. I, th I think it starts at the top and it works its way down. It starts with a vision and it starts with how you're going to attain that vision and the CEO then works with le the staff leadership on ideas on how do we attain this vision. And your, your culture within your organization is developed around that vision. And, it's, and it, it goes beyond, you know, we're going to help a lot of people and we're going to do great stuff. It, is, it goes down from what does the office look like? What does the color pattern look like? What, how do we treat people to HR? You know, what documents do we need? Do we need, you know, exit, exit interviews, um, employee handbooks, trainings, trainings, and more trainings. I'm a big fan of trainings. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, culture starts with the CEO because that's the person that's got the vision. And that's the person that's, that's, uh, that is um, really leading the ship. But I'm a big believer in, in uh, you know, CEO driven but employee led that the that's the servant leadership mentality is where the ceo is standing behind the staff steering the ship and letting letting this letting the staff take the recognition and let the staff uh, figure it out because mm -hmm. no one is as smart as, as the all of us and uh it's really important that the staff be brought along and be a big part of the staff's culture. And that's why, why you, when you bring new people on, it should be a very slow process, should be um, higher, slow and fire fast, because that person needs to fix, fit into your office chemistry. And it really is chemistry. So you take your time and have, I've had uh, departments interview a new employee. I, I've interviewed the employee, HR has interviewed the employee, and then I have the department uh, staff interview the employee because they're the ones that they're going to have to work with. Yeah, so, I do that as well. Yeah, but I also tell the staff this is not the Inquisition. <laughs> yeah, this is yeah. Just, this is just under you know learning to meet somebody and answer any questions uh, that you may have of that person. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, and I'm on board too, especially when you have somebody toxic or they just can't seem to accept their own responsibility in certain situations. Like they got to go because there's no room for that. That type of individual can destroy a team and its morale in like two seconds flat. So. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm with you there. So, okay. Yeah. Um, let's see my next question here. Um, how do you feel leadership, good or bad, impacts a business? Can you say that again? You're a little garbly. Oh, sorry. Um, how do you feel leadership, good or bad, impacts a business? Pfft. Hugely. I mean, it goes back to the, the story I had about the CEO that would, didn't understand why middle management wasn't pulling their weight. I mean, it's, it's leadership. It's, it's leadership sticking to the values and to the structure of the organization that, that, that leadership puts forth. Um, yeah, leadership. 
yeah, if, if the leaders, if the leadership's not buying in and pulling their weight, it'll fall apart. And then you'll start having like, you know, Mad Max, you'll start having tribes within the organization, uh, uh, doing their own thing and, and wanting to take power. Yeah. Like little mini coups. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Um, I can't and say I like, that I've never I like been a part of one. <laughs> no, but I've seen it and I, I've, yeah, I've seen it, I've seen it in action and it, it's, it's hard to get out of. I mean, it takes time to get into a mess and it takes time to get out of a mess. Yeah. And I think the problem is too, that a lot of, uh, especially larger businesses, um, they don't care enough. Oh, sorry. My sound went off. Uh, larger businesses don't seem to care enough about those kinds of things. Like if you have a 40% turnover rate, you have a problem. Like there's, there's a problem. Um, or even really a 20% turnover. If it's actually people leaving the company at that quick of a a clip, um, you're wasting tons of money and effort and energy in trying to onboard people. And you're not actually fixing the problem, which is why are all of these people consistently leaving your company? So, well, well, and, and I don't know if we've talked about this in the past, but you know, I, at Vinny's, I put together a, a, a class called Vinny University, and it was an eight-week course that I put all the employees through. I put them in groups of 16 because I, I wanted everybody to have the same foundation and the same language because the demographics of the staff at St. Vinny's is is huge. you got master's degree to, you know, ex-clients. And so I really wanted to bring them into a room and teach um, – leadership basics. And that's where, that's how I met Cockrell is, it was his book, uh, creating magic is <clears throat> I created a curriculum out of that book and it was an eight week course. And I wanted to empower the staff. I, I, I had a belief that I did not hire staff so I can do their job. I want them to do their job and I want them to do it exceptionally and with exceptional customer service. So we created an eight week program. And at the end of the eight weeks, everybody paired up and we had what we affectionately called the gong show. They were to come up with a business plan that addressed one of three areas, a money-making idea, a new program, or modifying an existing program. And they gave the presentation to the class. And you have, you have some major introverts and you got some extroverts, but they could present it in any way they wanted. They could do flip charts. They could do overhead projectors. They could do computers. They could do crayons as far as I cared. It was just a presentation. And then if the class decided that it was worthy, then the people that presented the, the, the program that presented the project got to lead it. They got to lead it. Oh, fun. So, so they, I mean, one of the cool things they, they produced was a code of a code of conduct, an employee code of conduct. I didn't do it. The staff did it, which I thought was really dang cool. Um, but, and the, but the gong show kind of grew to the point where we had to move to uh, the library at city hall because it not involved, not only involved the class, but alumni started to show up and uh, um, board members started showing up. And we used to, you know, so we created a, a, a crest and they got a t-shirt when they graduated and we called it Vinny University. It's, it's, not, it's not a university, it's a process. And uh, it, 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 all 103 employees and every time we get new employees, we would run them through it. So everybody had the same basic understanding of expectation. And the other thing is, is I taught that class. So they got to know me and I got to know them as an individual building that relationship. The relationship goes both ways. They got to know me. They got to know about my wife, my kids, what I did, where I'm from, but I have to do the same with them. And that's where that culture comes in, where it's, it it really was a family atmosphere and uh, amazing things came out of it. But, but if, if leadership doesn't have that kind of relationship with staff, bad things can definitely happen. Yeah, I think so. I think that's very true, especially when they feel like you don't value them as a person um, and as an individual, as opposed to just a number or an employee or somebody in a position that needs to be filled, that kind of thing. So, because nobody, nobody actually wants to feel that way. That's the whole thing that always blows my mind about this stuff is that like you as a leader also don't want to feel that about whoever your boss is. Like you don't want to feel like you're a number or they only care about you for your performance. So carry that foot. But that's the whole, um, like empathy, communication, right. common sense thing that we're talking about. Right. Too. Well, well and, but the funny thing is, is that we lead the way we, we lead the way we were led. Right. So I grew up in a restaurant family. My parents owned two restaurants. So I'd watch my father. Well, my father was very much, you know, 
do as I say, not as I do, you know, type, type A personality, hierarchy, top down. And so when I started leading people that way, um, I was on a long, lonely journey. <laughs> people who don't lead people are on a long, lonely walk. And that's when I said, you know, I used to throw coffee mugs. I used to, I used to be really stupid. And it, it just taught me that that type of motivation, quote unquote, <laughs> is, is counterintuitive. So it, it, that's when I started reading, the, like I said, the, the Stephen Coveys, the John Maxwells, the Zig Ziglar's, and, and later got into the, the Martin Luther Kings, the Gandhis, the Desmond Tutus of the world, um, uh, and the Dalai Lama. Dalai Lama books are fantastic. I mean, that's right. He taught me the, the difference between a, a job, a career, and a calling. You know, a job is something that everybody's had, and a career is what most people have. They get recognition, and they have friends. And a calling is something that you would do for free if you could do it. So, and, and, and that just kind of stuck with me. So it kind of mellowed me out, and it made me like, you know, I want to help people. I mean, there's a different way of doing things. And, and when, you start, when you start slowing down and getting to know the people, and they get to know you, uh, life's a lot better. And it's a lot harder to fire people. Firing's easy. It's hard to do, but it's easy. You can fire mm -hmm. anybody. Yeah. But how do you make it work? Why, why? People don't quit. People don't quit jobs. They quit people. So why why does this person want to leave? Or why do I want to fire them? When I hired them, they had an amazing quality that I liked. What happened? So something happened. That's why the relationship is vital. You, you to, to to totally understand that person's. Um, uh, situation. There, there, there's a reason why things are going on. And I found that out a lot. You know, a lot of times when people act up, it's usually something that's happened in their personal life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, my, my particular formula for leadership is clear expectations and consistent accountability. And it makes the, the firing process when you have to do it a lot um, easier, I guess, especially for people that struggle with giving criticism or get having tough feedback. And that's a lesson that I had to learn because I used to be kind of the opposite when I started my leadership journey, it was a lot softer and I was worried about people liking me. And if I, if I held them accountable, are they going to hate me and think I'm a terrible boss right. and those kinds of things. So I had to work through a lot of that and really just setting super clear expectations up front um, helps with that process because then it's just, even if the accountability is like, Hey, I thought you were going to do the thing. And they were like, Oh shoot. Yeah. It's, that's just the, it's the reinforcement that happens. And then if it keeps happening, then the conversation ends up on paper <laughs> at some point. Exactly. Um, exactly. And yeah, but I mean, I've had people apologize to me for me firing them because they felt like they were letting me down because I believed in mm -hmm. them and I tried everything I could. And I'm like, hey, what, you know, gave them every opportunity under the sun. And at the end, I'm like, hey, you're putting me in a position to have to consider your livelihood. And I don't think right. that that's super fair for me, um, but that's where we are. So good day <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and good luck. And I hope you figure out whatever you figure out. But yeah. um, that's like, that takes a lot of work because again, like you said, it's the relationship building, knowing your team, um, giving them every benefit of the doubt and trying to help them get where they need to go. But sometimes you can't help them. So right. when it comes down to it, you know, Cockrell taught me leadership is doing what has to be done when it has to be done, the way it has to be done, whether you like it or not, and whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. So our job is to build the relationships to make sure the job gets done, right? And yeah. you're right. If we don't have a relationship with people, it's really easy to fire people. It's not fun. That's one of the least favorite things I've ever got to do. <laughs> but, yeah. but I've also had people who have felt bad because they let me down. Um, and, it, and it hurts more for me because I've actually built relationships. You know, I know that person's spouse and I know the kids and I remember when their youngest was born and I brought them a gift and, you know, it, it's hard. It, it, but I will tell you that once we started building relationships, our um, people leaving percentage dropped dramatically. I bet. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, and then you find out who the people are because some people are just kind of toxic and maybe they'll grow out of it at some point, but they're at a point where they take no responsibility for their actions and really aren't interested in growing as a person. And those people you can't help. And those people are bad for a culture. So that's mm -hmm. usually... Where for me, like when I, I'm like, okay, they, there's nothing that can be done at this point. <laughs> um, right. They've said some really terrible things about a lot of people and that's just, that can't, that can't be stood for. So. Yeah. Um, and, and am I batting a thousand? No. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've hired some bad people. 
Um, oh, sure. But yeah. I, but, but it's, it's a learned thing. You got to learn how to hire people. Yeah, I agree. And it's sometimes I, it's usually those instances where maybe I want to take a chance on somebody and then maybe it doesn't work out for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, no, I've definitely, <laughs> definitely made yeah. some real bad choices and, uh, you know, had to pay for that later. But yeah. <laughs> that's, again, yeah. that's part of your own accountability is like, well, that was a bad decision. I guess I have to clean up that mess now. Sure. Oops. Sure. <laughs> uh, well, and it also yeah. gets to a point where, where you, you want to be, you want to be the leader and you want to be part of the team. And the last thing you want to do is become a babysitter. Mm -hmm. You know, my daughter, my, my daughter works for a large corporation in Seattle <laughs> and she became a leader and she said, do you have any advice for me? And, you know, she's, she's grown up with me reading books and talking about books and I bought her books and she rolls her eyes at me, but <laughs> she's now in the, in the management of this large corporation, global corp corporation. And she goes, do you have any advice for me? And I said, do everything you can to get the most out of your staff without having to become a babysitter because it will be the biggest babysitting job you've ever had if you go that way. And yeah. from like, like week two, she was dealing with a sexual harassment issue. And, I, and she called me up and she goes, I should have listened to those books that I grew up with. I should have hung on to those books that you gave me. <laughs> and I go, yeah, it's the, the struggle is real. Yeah. Yep. And it, I mean, sometimes you just don't know, like you got to go through some of that stuff and that's how you learn and you become a better leader and a better person too. Like, exactly. it's, yeah, it's about the employees, but it's also about you and your growth. So Mm -hmm. Um, you just, sometimes you don't know until you mess something up like that and you're like, oh, wow. Okay. Well, I know how I would do that differently now. <laughs> yeah. So well, we'll I, see I can, again. If I, had a, if I had a nickel every time I Good said that, I mean, because leaders, leaders are never stopped <laughs> yeah. learning. Right. Like I said, yeah, early on, ideally, you know, th there are times when I'll say, yeah, I pretty much know it all. And then something will happen. And I'll go, wow, I didn't see that one coming. Wow. That's new. Even after 30 years, yeah. I was seeing goofy stuff and I'm like, wow, that's, that came out of that field. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes uh, I have a I have a lot of faith in my perception of people too. I'm pretty intuitive and I have a pretty good bullshit detector. And so I rely on that. And then sometimes it fails, you know, somebody's just a really good, you know, smoke blower. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, oh, well, I really thought that I had that one nailed down too. So there's certain things where I think you've kind of developed those like super skills that you have maybe, and you just right. automatically listen to your instincts and um, yeah. Sometimes it, sometimes it well, backfires, but right. And you don't want to be, but you, you're also aware of it. And so you don't want to become jaded either. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could look at people and go, yeah, they're dumb, but no, he's like, tell me more about you. I, you know, and, and that's where you, that's where the questions at interview time really come in and people need to get, get away from the, the basic interview questions and, you know, yes. tell me about something that worked really well for you or tell me something that you led, you know, it's more of a, you know, what's the first thing you, you think of when, when you meet someone new, mm -hmm. you know, you, how do you, what, what are you like at a party? You know, the best, <laughs> yeah. the best, the best interview question I was ever given. And I still talk about it is when I was be, at, being interviewed to be the director of the United way. And the question was, um, if the United way is a hamburger, what part of a hamburger are you? <laughs> and I went, I like that. Yeah. what? <laughs> but but I, I immediately I do without thinking I went I'm the bun I'm the one that holds it together but it, it oh, was just yeah. you know it was but it was like where the heck do you come up with that and then I found out he was a family yeah. therapist and that explained volumes for me so oh yeah yeah no I totally agree on the interview stuff I like to I mean there's like certain questions that it's you know kind of frame up what we're going to talk about but ultimately I like to have casual conversations because you get to know a lot about who somebody is really a lot faster that way. And that helps me with hiring stuff where I'm not making misses as much because somebody, once you start getting them loosened up and they start telling you all kinds of weird crap about their, whatever their drama is and yes. their ex that just quit selling crack out of their house <laughs> or whatever, yes. people, people will tell you all kinds of crap. If you just sort of loosen it up, get a little casual. And like you said, just try and get to know the person instead of yep. the, the form stuff, yep. save saves time. I always, always sure. used to look for uh, I always used to look for employees or team members um, at uh, in the retail world. I would go to restaurants and and, oh, yeah. and watch watch the the wait staff or the grocery store or the retail because yeah. how they conduct themselves in public. I mean, you're like watching the animals in the wild. You're, this is how this is how they're going to act, right? 
So you, mm-hmm. that's where you'll talk to them and say, you know, what if I paid you a little bit more and gave you a little bit more? Would you come work work for us? And I've done that. Yeah. Um, that's that's part of the fun, especially when you 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 frequent a restaurant that's got that 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 you become friends with the wait staff. Mm-hmm. That's when you're like, have you ever thought about working for me? I've had a yeah. few say no because I don't want to ruin our friendship. <laughs> oh. I said, well, at least you're honest. I appreciate that. Right. Yeah, that's like getting out of the friend zone. They're like, no, I'd rather just be friends with you. I don't want to take that risk. <laughs> right. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. No, it's good. <laughs> um, so what what advice would you give business owners for developing a healthy culture? Have a real clear vision on what you want your organization to look like. I think that's really important. Clarity is everything. People got to understand where you're coming from before they can even buy into what your what you what your culture is. So have a real clear picture in your mind of what you want and be able to communicate it effectively to your team. I think that's probably the most important. I think that's where a lot of business owners trip. I'm going to say I'm not going to say fail or falter, but I'll say trip because they're going to come out and, and want to do one thing and find out it's not working. And then they don't know why it's not working. It, it's clear in their head. Well, like we said earlier, you know, common sense isn't common practice. <laughs> uh, but make sure you, you understand that. And also get to know your team and sit with them. You know, what I always did is before I rolled anything new out is I would sit with staff in, individually or in small group and say, this is kind of what I want to do. How's this sound to you? Because if, if, if they're going to ask me questions, I have to be able to answer their questions. If I can't answer their questions, I'm not ready to roll it out. So mm-hmm. I would always ask staff. And then, then it came when it came to the major announcement to the staff, everybody's heard of it. So it's nothing new to them. But yeah. ha- make sure staff have input. But make sure you have a, a vision of where you're going and, it's, and you can explain it uh, clearly uh, before, before you do anything drastic. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, how about developing leadership skills as a mm-hmm. business owner? What about advice for owner? that? Yeah. Uh, uh, the lead, the leader itself or leading other or, or other people or for leader with other people. Um, yeah. Either whatever, well, whatever you have. Well, I'm a big fan of, of, um, training, love training. I believe that people, leaders need to be sponges. All leaders at all levels need to be sponges, official and unofficial. If you want to be exceptional at what you do, you, you've got to stay ahead of the curve. You've got to be up on technology. You've got to be up on reading about it. Um, you're, you're a leadership sponge. Um, I always, uh, enjoyed going to, uh, nonprofit events and learn about, what's new and exceptional coming down the line that I can take back to my staff and my team. Um, you know, one of my, one of my three executive director buddies, you know, he's a big tech guy. So he and I meet and he, he would always tell me about, Oh, well, we use this program. And I'm like, Oh, really? What is that? Tell me about that. And I, I would start, I, I would, I would, I would integrate it with what we're doing. Um, that's why when, before I left, we integrated an artificial intelligence program with the homeless population. So, that was kind of fun, uh, kind of tracking and keeping track and being in communication and making sure they're getting the services they need through artificial intelligence using technology because everyone's got a cell phone. Even homeless people have a cell phone. Um, but you got to keep it in order. Uh, the leadership needs to constantly train, constantly push, um, um, raising that bar and making sure they're up to date because if an organization becomes stagnant, they'll become obsolete in a matter of five, ten years. So training yeah. and, and be a, be a leadership sponge. I like that. Okay. Don't be stagnant. Um, yeah, no, I think that that's, that's a lot of what I see, like the companies that just continually are evolving and they still keep, you know, the core of what they are there, but then continuing to evolve and grow as like social media is changing, like TikTok's new clubhouse is new. There's all these things that people are doing, even parlor, like, all this stuff is just limitless. And if you don't know what that stuff is, like for me, like I teach people how to use social media effectively for their business. So sure. I better know how TikTok and Clubhouse work, even though maybe I don't necessarily use those platforms for my own business right now. 
I'm right. on them. I know how they work. I know what they do. I know that how they can help people. But yeah, if you just like don't let, if you don't stay ahead of the curve, then you're gonna. Well, and it's and it's and it's incredibly it's it's incredible how pervasive social media is. A lot of organizations haven't globbed onto the social media wagon yet. And you know, oh yeah, Facebook's mm-hmm. now for old people like me, and uh, uh, Twitter never really held it for me. But LinkedIn, God, I love LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. You know, I always say that's that's Facebook for businesses. Yeah, that's funny. I, mean, I I literally just did a Facebook Live in uh, my social media group the other night, that, and I said exactly that thing. I was like, well, I mean, it's like Facebook for business, but also here's how it's different, and this is how you can add value here. So, because yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. that's and what people ask me all the time. <laughs> yeah, and there's not a lot of political talk on it, which is what yes. I really enjoy. Yep, that's exactly what I was saying. It's a lot easier to be spammy on LinkedIn. So the content tends to be a little bit higher quality because people will sort of self-regulate the platform. They're like, get out of here, go to Facebook with that nonsense. Like exactly. we're not here. We're not here for that. We're trying to, sh- we're trying to share good works. Um, yes. Thanks anyway. <laughs> it's pretty Love funny. It. Yeah. Um, all right. So do you have any last thoughts for me um, before we kind of start wrapping up? Or well, no, not for I, me, for everyone. <laughs> I'm excited that you're doing this podcast. I think it's fantastic. Uh, you make you made me incredibly comfortable. I know we've been friends a little while, but um, this was fun. It was it, what I liked about it was very conversational. So <laughs> yeah, keep going, man. Thanks. I'm excited. I uh, yeah, because it's like I've been talking to all these people, and I'm like, I have all these amazing resources in my network and my sphere that I feel like have more that they can share with you know business owners entrepreneurs the world in general yeah because like we just kind of talked about people like being better people really is kind of the whole the crux of leadership so yeah, you know, yeah my, no, I'm stoked. my good my good friend mike baker who's the ceo of heritage health here in Coeur d'Alene, he told me you know the number one leadership i got advice i got is don't be an asshole <laughs> yeah and, yep and, and so i kind of just went that's there's a book right there. <laughs> yep. That's that's frequently a joke that I make about um, employees, how you have to have, sometimes you have to have conversations. Like theoretically, the rule is don't be an asshole, take a shower, brush your teeth, show up on time. Um, but I've had to have that conversation way more times than you would think <laughs> with a bunch of quote unquote adults. But Common sense hard. isn't common practice. Yep. <laughs> And everybody's parents taught them different things or parents or lack thereof, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I'm like, Hey, yeah. so listen, buddy. Um, yeah, yeah. It's okay to be an asshole. <laughs> yeah. Don't be an asshole. Not. That's my favorite. <laughs> yep. Um, so tell us where we can find you or, you know, if you've got things you're working on promotions, website stuff. Oh, sure. Well, my website, as we talked earlier is Connery leadership Uh, but I too have a podcast called nonprofit world supporting the community safety net. That's on Apple and Spotify, and I just signed up with Gia or Gi, so real popular in India right now. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, so I, you know, I do the podcast and I talk about leadership situations, and that's always kind of fun. But uh, with me as an organization right now, as the world is starting to open up, uh, I do a lot of board retreats or I'll do a lot of one-on-one coaching. So that's always fun. If anybody wants to email me, it's Jeff at Conroy leadership consulting.com. Uh, and I, I, I respond pretty quickly. It's not a robot. It's me. And, uh, and then I'm on Facebook and I'm on LinkedIn and yep. The usual, the usual social media, but, uh, yeah, thank you for having me. This is great. Yes. You too. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, Anytime. and I'm sure we will, we will be in touch. I hope soon. so. <laughs> yeah. I, I enjoy, I enjoy our conversations. Yes, me too. Building Better Businesses with Catalyst Consulting is brought to you in partnership with Delicious Hamburgers. Why Delicious? Since 1998, Delicious has been providing Spokane's best burgers. Why? Because at Delicious, the burgers are never frozen. Why? Because it tastes better. Delicious prides itself on fresh beef, fresh veggies, and made-to-order fries. And with a variety of sauces all made in-house each day, you can trust that everything is meticulously handmade the same way it has been since 1998. So what are you waiting for? Delicious is located at 1625 North Division Street. De-lovable, delightable, delectable, delicious. Life is a series of challenges, paths to walk, rivers to cross, mountains to climb. It takes strength, perseverance, and the endurance to keep going. 
Spokane Endurance Academy is a new face in the Inland Northwest training scene, ready and excited to help you make a difference in your life. Offering everything from specialized workout plans to field testing, defined intensity training, and progress analysis. At Spokane Endurance Academy, your goals are their goals. Check them out on Facebook at Spokane Endurance Academy, LLC, on their website, SpokaneEnduranceAcademy.com, or call now at 208-889-9278. This episode is sponsored by Brick West Brewing. Brick West is a touchstone that reminds us where we came from and the foundation that gives rise to where we're going. With an enthusiasm for craft beer only matched by their passion for building community, here at Brick West, the goal of each day is to bring people together, inspire adventure, and build lifelong friendships through quality craft brews. Located at the west end of downtown Spokane, Brick West is serving up a variety of different beers in their spacious beer hall atmosphere. With plenty of to-go options and a large outdoor space, come down and check out Brick West Brewing today. This podcast was produced and edited by Speak Spokane.